Okay, this sermon's entitled, Your Will Be Done. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 111 reads, Praise ye the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright, and in the congregation, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. Now, if you turn over to Matthew chapter 6, we see the Lord's Prayer, and it basically describes the will of God. It says in verse 8, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of, before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, you know, forever, amen. Now, if you jump back to verse uh, 9, or actually verse 10, it, it says that thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Whatever God's will is, it's supposed to reflect, you know, the afterlife, it's supposed to reflect, you know, the kingdom of heaven. So, even on this earth, God has a will for us, and we need to understand what that is. Now, let's turn back to Matthew, or actually turn forward to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we see where the false prophets like to quote verses that talk about the will of God, and they have a, a very vexatious interpretation of this verse. It's, it's very annoying, and it's only something the unsaved would would conclude, and they think that doing the will of God is something that is perpetual. It's something that's continual or perennial, or it's something serial, or it's something consecutive. It's something that's done, you know, piecemeal, over and over again. When that's not the case at all, the will of God, in, in this sense, it takes place at, the mo- at one moment in time. And that's why we need to understand that when it comes to salvation, the will of God is simply to believe on Jesus Christ. And that's what this is talking about. But if you turn over to Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 21. It says, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, he's saying right here clearly, the only people that are going to heaven are those that have done the will of God, the will of the Father. But see, the false prophet tries to say, once again, you have to keep doing the will. And they try to say it's works. And that's not what it means at all. The will of the Father is to simply believe on Jesus Christ. And we see this in John chapter 6. Let's take a look at verse 40. John chapter 6, verse 40 reads, And this is the will of him that sent me. Now, who's the one that sent Christ? God the Father, obviously. And it tells us right there, This is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, we have three promises based on these scriptures. If you want to kind of triangulate them together, we have those who do the will of the Father will, will go to heaven. Then we have those who do the will of the Father will have everlasting life. And they will be raised up at the last day. It's, it's basically the same thing. You know, you're, you're saved. You're going to heaven. And the will of the Father is to simply believe on Jesus Christ. That is to take him at his word. You believe on him. He died, was buried, and rose again. And then you're saved forever. You'll, you'll, you, you have everlasting life at that moment. And you will be raised up at the last day. Now, that's a one-time event. The moment you believe on Christ, you're saved and secure forever, and you're guaranteed to be raised up at the last day. That's what that means, to do the will of the Father in terms of salvation. But see, the Bible also speaks of doing the will of the Father, and doing you know, ha- you know, people having a will in their life. And I want to focus more on just how do we carry out God's will in our life. A lot of people are wondering this, and they have no clue. Well, Jesus Christ basically tells us He kind of sets a paradigm for us in Luke chapter 22. Let's go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 22 and read a couple verses here. The key is don't do it your way. Do it God's way. 
A lot of people, they say, I want to know what God's will in my life is, but they want to do it their way. They want it to be something of their own you know, choice. And that's not how it works. We have to do things God's way. Luke chapter 22, let's start off with verse 39. It reads, it says, He came out and went, as he was wont, and that means accustomed, okay, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that she enter not into temptation. It's kind of like a parallel, or a parallelism, to... You know, lead us not into temptation. Now, one of the keys is prayer. But, th- see, it goes on to say, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed. Now, in verse 42 it reads, Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So, Jesus Christ is saying, It's not up to me. It's up to God. That's why it's, Thy will be done. It's God's will. So he's basically saying it's whatever God wants. And that's the the key to understanding um, how to carry out God's will. He sets a paradigm in these verses. It's not my will. It's it's God's will. Now, I have found that one of the keys is to basically get rid of a bunch of garbage in your life. You know, basically clean up your life. When a person's life is filled up with sin... And filled up with, you know, secularity. Filled up with a bunch of worldliness. You know, if you're surrounded by worldly people. Or you have a worldly, you know, occupation. And you're just surrounded by the garbage of this world. You will never carry out God's will. Because you have to basically get rid of, you know, the things that you you desire. And start turning it over to what the Bible says. Now let's take a look at a few verses that talk about this. All right, turn over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, and let's take a look at a few verses here. Start off with verse 29, it reads, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore... Excuse me, this my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Now look at verse 30, it says, He must increase... But I must decrease. It's talking about Christ, okay? And that means he must become more important. And I must become of less importance. And that's the mentality that we should have. Is whenever you put yourself first and foremost, then we will never carry out God's will. Because God's will has to be about God, not about us. Now turn back to Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, we see a, a lot of passages that the lordship people like to take out of context, and they've, what they fail to see is that there's a difference between salvation and discipleship. There's a difference between salvation and rewards. There's a difference between something being free and something being costly, and you can't conflate the two together. Then you have a completely perverted gospel that, that does not save anyone. See, once a person is saved by the grace of God... Then we are called to start denying ourselves, And this is how we see God's will, in self-denial. Another word for this is abnegation. So let's start off with verse 38. It says, And he that taketh not his cross, and followeth after me, is not worthy of me. <clears throat> what he's saying is that if, if you're not going to take up, take up your cross, and start denying yourself, and you're not going to follow Christ, you're not worthy to be his disciples. I'm not talking about salvation. Nobody's worthy of salvation. That's why it's a free gift. That's why it's all by grace. That's why Jesus paid it all at the cross. But see, now we're dealing with another issue. We're dealing with discipleship. And I believe God's will is for us to become disciples, us, us to grow, us to learn God's word. God wants us to be preachers. He wants us to be soul winners. But we have to deny ourselves, and we have to start carrying our cross. It's kind of like a metaphor for just, you know, emulating Jesus. You know, that's what it's talking about. So let's keep reading. It says in verse 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life shall, you know, for my sake shall find it. What God wants us to do is to take our life, the things that we think are so important, all this fluff out there that in the, in the world, you know, our job, you know, our livelihood at, at home, whatever we do for entertainment, take all that stuff and lose it. Get rid of that stuff. You don't need it. Okay? Or 
I mean, you do need a job, of course, but you should do it, your job in a way that honors God. We're talking about losing your, your secular life. And then it says, once you, once you lose that stuff that's not important, it says that you will find your real, your, your real purpose in life, and it's going to be for God's sake. So we need to understand that if you want to do the will of God, it's going to take some sacrifice. It's going to take getting rid of some junk and start following Christ, and then, then we'll see what, what his will is. And that's what it's talking about. It's not talking about literally losing your life. It's talking about losing your so-called life. You know, a lot of times when a person is, a, is obsessed with something, or they're addicted to something, we say they have no life, or whatever they're addicted to, that's their life. Well, that's what God is telling us we should lose. It's the type of sacrifice that it, that is you know necessary in finding out what God's will is. Just imagine a person who's just like a, a TV junkie, sits there all day watching that, that crud, could you imagine him ever finding out what God's will is in the midst of all that? It's impossible. What the person needs to do is turn the stupid thing off and go find a secluded area and start reading the Bible. Start reading it afresh, you know, and just find out what God's will is. I mean, could you imagine like the Apostle Paul, you know, being lazy and carnal and, you know, and worldly and, and then finding out what God's will is in the midst of it? No. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We see that. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and, to, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all, you know, Achaia, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it even says right here that being an apostle was the will of God. And I believe God has lots of different positions you know, for believers in Christ. He wants people to be preachers. He wants people to be soul winners. He wants people, you know, to spend a lot of time in prayer. He wants people to meditate on the Bible and study it and learn it. And, you know, to answer, you know, tough questions and whatnot. My point is, is God has a will for all of us. And most people miss it because they're too busy doing their own thing. They're too busy just going through the motions of life, uh, living a static, empty, somewhat inert life. It's, it's sad. And it's kind of like the, you know, the treadmill effect. They're moving. And they're going motoriously, but they're not actually moving in any you know, productive direction. And it's a sad thing. So I believe we all need to find out what God's will is. And we need to keep in mind that it's going to be God's will and not ours. Because our will, you know, it's, it's never going to work. So Matthew chapter 6, let's close with one verse. <clears throat> And there's something I want to point out about this verse. Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, it says, or actually verse 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now notice it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. God wants you to put him first. You put God first, and then he'll take care of you, and then he'll provide for you. A lot of people, they want to put God last. They say, well, let me get my, my chores done first, and then I'll read the Bible. It should be the other way around. So that's all I have. In order to know God's will, we have to, like I said, like, like the Bible says, we have to decrease, and God needs to increase in our lives. That's all I have. Let me go ahead and uh, close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to understand that in terms of salvation, you know, your will is for us to believe on Jesus Christ and then we're saved forever and promised to be raised up at the last day. And I just pray that you'll reveal to us on a daily basis, you know, what your will is from that point on. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.